So Jordan Peterson has apparently had his fellowship offer rescinded very quickly. And I think it was because he said he called them like like sniveling cowards or something, which I don't know exactly what happened. I saw a tweet. Somebody uh, screen grabbed it before he deleted it, I think. And it was aggressive. Uh, I, I, again, we'll, we'll read this story to figure out what's going on. But if we if we have time, I have another story about Joe Rogan I want to talk about because there's a it's, a it's a decent criticism, but there's a ridiculous bubble problem. This is a Slate story. Slate's pretty far left. But let's, let's, let's we'll read about Jordan Peterson, see if we make it. A controversial Canadian academic who once called on women to stand up against their crazy harpy sisters. Oh, my God. Has had the offer of a fellowship rescinded by the University of Cambridge. Jordan Peterson, 56, who has starkly divided global opinion with his views on topics such as masculinity, political correctness, and the gender pay gap, had expected to take up a fellowship with the Faculty of Divinity. The reason why I, I highlight the Joe Rogan story is they really do believe there's a divided global opinion on this, when the reality is it is a tiny bubble of fringe lunatic leftists who think these things. So, so um, let's read a little bit more, and then I want to highlight something from the other story. However, on Wednesday, the department said the offer had been rescinded after further review. Peterson, a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, started to earn global headlines in 2016 when he spoke out against so-called campus culture wars, where he claimed social justice warrior left-wing radical political activists were running rampant. They are. They also talk about how he opposed Bill C-16 and said that people— will eventually or pot- could potentially be arrested for misgendering someone in the UK. They are. Was Jordan Peterson wrong about either of those things? He wasn't. <laughs> so, of course, Independent, which is pretty left. Uh, Independent doesn't do a bad job. I-, I, will, I will say this. They definitely reported on Antifa being labeled as an extremist group. So they do lean left. But, you know, take their bias into account and give them credit where it's due. In, in his first lecture, Peterson, the author of se- uh, several books, yada, yada, said, there's a difference between saying something you uh, between saying something you can't say and saying and saying that there are things that you have to say. He told a, uh, he, he told a public debate on the topic. I regard these made up pronouns, all of them as neologisms of a radical PC authoritarianism. I'm not going to be a mouthpiece for language I detest. For language I detest, he would say. On Wednesday, a spokesperson for the University of Cambridge confirmed the offer had been revoked, but refused to provide any further explanation. We can confirm that Jordan Peterson requested a visiting fellowship. An initial offer has been rescinded after further review. Uh, This is kind of a follow up. uh, I I should have done this video first. Uh, I didn't. On my main channel, I talked about Jordan Peterson's book being banned by a New Zealand distributor. And this shows you the power of the fringe left and the weird views that they hold. While they are a ridiculous fringe minority bubble, the the, the reality is they've infected high, high, like powerful uh, areas of society or have just terrified certain industries and institutions. Now, let's talk about this. Following the Joe Rogan podcast, I received a massive outpouring of support from the mainstream left, people who didn't want their identities revealed or didn't explicitly say anything, but I'm not going to reveal some of their identities because they don't want to lose their jobs. Let's pop over here. Joe Rogan's galaxy brain, how the former Fear Factor host's podcast became an essential platform for free thinkers who hate the left. I'd like to point something out. Joe Rogan is almost a socialist. I've talked to him about it. You know, not I think it, it, I'm pretty sure it came up on the podcast. He asked me about universal basic income. I am no fan. Um, I understand that some people view it's contradictory because I was willing to donate to Andrew Yang. It's more complicated than that, but we're not going to talk about that. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. I'm disclosing that whenever it comes up. But Rogan is very close to being a socialist, believing that, you know, he's to the left of me. I'm center left. These are policy positions, not ideologies. It's not that people who hate the left, it's that we don't like your religion. Okay, let me let me let me say it. Let me spell it for you. I believe in left wing policy, policy, including civil rights policy. But your religion shouldn't be allowed in my policy. Yes, I understand there's a difference between the ideology and an actual dogma of religion, but it's, a da- it's, it's dangerous when you have people who believe things that aren't based in reality and want to impose law on these things. I don't care what your religion is. I, 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 America is awesome. Can I just talk about how awesome America is? First of all, Bill of Rights, wow. Founding fathers, you guys killed it. You could have done a better job in clarifying the Second Amendment for sure, but I still think you did a pretty damn good job. However, what we have now is in a fringe authoritarian left 
that is part of a, a dogma, right? It's, it's, it's these people who just want to adhere to the authoritarian group. They're pro-war. It's really weird. They believe that certain words are offensive and shouldn't be allowed, and they have nothing to do with what true left libertarian or liberal positions are. However, these fringe groups, you know, um, people like Justin Peters who live in this bubble think it's true. I want to point something out. Justin Peters' article here, it's actually a fairly decent criticism of the Joe Rogan podcast. He talks about, uh, as I said to Dave Rubin in the interview I did with him recently, we could do with a pie in the face every so often. I mean that metaphorically. That you can't just be in a bubble of people, you know, singing your praises and talking about great things all day because you'll never improve. You can't see all of your blind spots. You do need criticism. So I read this, and I think there's some really great points brought up in it. So, so I actually, w- w- you, you guys should read it. It's not bad. But I will say this. It's clear the bias is there. It's clear this person is in a tiny bubble. I don't want to deviate too much from the Jordan Peterson story. We'll go back to it. But I want to, I want to focus on one important thing at the end of this article. Clearly, the article talks about me because I was on two of the, like, some of the most high-profile episodes jo- uh, Joe's ever done. I am extremely grateful for that. Uh, Alex Jones being the most. So he talks about, uh, he says this, uh, you know, that's just ridiculous, Poole said, and the two men proceeded to mutually establish that Yiannopoulos did not literally instruct his followers to attack, attack Jones by repeatedly calling her ugly, which uh, uh, ugly, he, he was perhaps just engaging in a form of film criticism. That's a fact. Milo Yiannopoulos never told his followers to directly target Jones. That is even established by Twitter on the podcast. This man's clearly in a bubble. But by all means, criticize me. I'm, I'm, I'm completely open to legitimate criticism. And I want to say this is actually really good legitimate criticism because a lot, oftentimes you have people just scream Nazi. That's ridiculous. No, this, this guy's clearly biased, but he does a, a good job of pointing things out. I want to push back a little bit. And this loops back into the story about Jordan Peterson. He says, for three and a half hours, Rogan and Tim Pool pressed Dorsey and Twitter exec Vijaya Gade on their reasons for banning Yiannopoulos, Jones, McInnes, Wall, Chuck Johnson, among others on the importance of allowing conservatives to misgender people online, and on the injustice of permabanning the right-wing trolls and anti-intellectual intellectuals to whom Rogan is indebted for his late career success. It was a tough interview. Appreciate that. Though one unlikely to be appreciated outside of of the Breitbart set. Finally, we saw what the third eye adorning Rogan's mug on his podcast art really sees, fear. The reason I highlight this in, in reference to the Jordan Peterson story is that the reality is it wasn't the Breitbart set that appreciated that line of questioning. That interview was the third most popular podcast in the world. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. I think Joe does a pretty good job, but not perfect. Joe had on Renee DeResta a few days later. She works for New Knowledge. People were very critical of that. Joe is not perfect, but he absolutely does have a wide range of topics. For, for Like he talks about MMA on his show. But, but I, I'm, I'm derailing here, right? The issue is Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson was booted, and many people accuse him of all of these horrifying things. They say that he's divided global opinion. Following the Joe Rogan podcast, I was inundated with support from left-wing personalities, saying that it was really great, they appreciated what I was doing, and these things are worrying to them. I was invited to some of the craziest things ever invited to. I've had pro skateboarders who tend to be progressive and on the left hitting me up and offering me free gear, telling me to fly out because, you know, I've been a skateboarder most of my life. So I had all of a sudden these people were like, oh, my God, I found out you were a skateboarder. That was so cool what you did on Rogan. You definitely got to come skate with us. And I'm like, oh, it's so cool. I'm I'm probably not going to be able to because this is my, you know, I work on this. I don't have time to go off on these adventures like I used to, but I probably will end up skating with them eventually. But also some other higher profile left wing personalities hitting me up saying that, you know, it's the typical narrative. They like Jordan Peterson. They rec- like normal people get this. They understand what's going on. The idea that people think he's divided global opinion scares me. The, the fact that this person thinks only Breitbart people like my interview, it's, it's crazy. They really think these things. Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist with over a million followers. He was making something like, I don't know, sixty dollars to $80,000 a month. He has a New York Times bestseller he made millions of dollars off of. This is not only conservatives. It is moderate and left-wing people. But there is a fringe minority of people on the left who can't see this. I think one of the reasons for it is that a lot of them are in elite ivory tower journalism and academia. They can't see outside their own bubble. They're blinded from the inside of this tower, and they only see each other. They follow each other, and they don't realize 
In the real world, people are scared of you. They really are. They're scared of these people. Jordan Peterson isn't. Jordan Peterson had his book banned by a New Zealand major distributor, and he had his, uh, his Cambridge fellowship rescinded because these people are, are scary to the left. Why is it that so many organizations bend over backwards for these activists? It's not because they agree with them. It's because they're scared of violent authoritarians. South Park taught, South Park taught us this lesson. They had an episode where they actually had, it was the super best friends, I think it was called, and it was religious figures, of which it included Muhammad. Comedy Central won't air that episode anymore. And in a later episode, they wanted to show Muhammad and Comedy Central censored it. They censored the entire closing speech of the episode. I kid you not, look it up. It was a bleep. The whole thing was bleeped. The speech was about how terror works. And I'll end by saying one last thing. Why is it that Twitter and these other organizations will bend over backwards for the far left? Is it because they're far left? Well, to a certain degree, they are a little bit. Google is too. That's true. There's also some regular people who work in these companies. The reality is, as I love to say, do you think a group of liberalists, Sargon of Akkad and his, and his followers, are going to show up in black masks with Molotov cocktails and crowbars, bashing skulls, setting fires, and destroying property? Of course not. Is Antifa? Of course they will. So who do you think they're going to bend over for? The police can't stop Antifa when it's a flash mob. They can't. They can come in after the fact, but even then they show up at Berkeley and committed, what, like $100,000 of the damage because Milo was going to speak? So of course they're going to bend over backwards for the fringe lunatics who are violent. The reality is most Americans don't like this, even people on the left. However, I will also throw criticism to those on the left who refuse to speak up and just hide. I can't blame them, though. I can't because it is not an easy world to live in. I know some high profile individuals on the left who have actually quit the public eye. You, you, I, and I, I know most of you know who these people are, but I'm not going to name them. They've quit. And I've, I've talked to them and they've said it is so great to be off social media and away from these lunatics. And they just want to get away from it all. I don't blame them. It's, it's, it, these people are a nightmare. We'll leave it there. Stick around. I got one more video coming up in a few minutes.